says long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets but in these last days he has spoken to us by the son whom he appointed the heir of all things through whom also he created the world he is the radiance of the glory of God the exact imprint of his nature and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. We're going to begin this morning by singing the hymn on the screens, O God of our fathers, creator and Lord, majestic in glory by heaven adored, now revealed to us in Christ. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Gladly we bow before you, O God of our fathers, and our God also. And we bless you, Lord, for your extraordinary patience in dealing with your people all through the ages. 
for the sheer scale of your mercy, your grace, as you have constantly revealed yourself to rebellious, recalcitrant, sinful people who have not loved you as they ought, have not listened and obeyed you as they should. And yet you have consistently and mercifully borne with our weaknesses and led us, even granting us the name of your own family, putting upon us your own name and sharing with us the abundant blessings of your heaven. We marvel, Lord, at, at the depth and the breadth and the height and the length of your extraordinary saving love. And we praise you that we have such a God. And Lord, we who live in these last days, we share the abundant blessing of having known your final word to mankind in the person of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom you've completed your finished work of salvation through his great sacrifice for our sins to restore us forever into fellowship with you that we might draw near to you, naming your name as our Father and with certainty knowing that we have through our Lord Jesus, complete salvation and ready entrance and access into the very throne room of heaven. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us and for the multitude of privileges that are ours as your people in these last days in the church of Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would therefore tether us to you. Keep us, we pray, from drifting, from turning back. Never let us turn away from all that you've given us in the, in the wonders of our Lord Jesus to drift back and fix our eyes and our hearts on mere earthly things. We pray that you would continue day by day to lift our hearts above where our true treasure is to be found. And so, Almighty God, who shows to them that are in error the light of thy truth to the intent that they may return to the way of righteousness, grant unto all of us in this fellowship of Christ's church that we also may turn away from things contrary to our profession and rather follow all such things as are agreeable to the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, a warm welcome to you all this morning. I see lots of you are coughing and spluttering as I am, so uh, lots of viruses floating around here this morning. Do wash your hands when you get home. Anyway, don't come too close to me. I'm full of the cold, but I'm up here, and uh, you're mostly safe in the meantime. Welcome if you're visiting with us. Uh, it's your first time here, then uh, you're particularly welcome. We hope we'll have a chance to meet you and greet you uh, after the service, and that you feel at home as part of our fellowship here, uh, a gathering of the Lord's people. I think you have on your seats these um, notice sheets. Um, on the front there, it tells you about our services later on today. Do come along either... Uh, at Queen's Park or at Kelvin Grove, 4.30 or 6.30, or of course the uh, Farsi service here at 5.30, which many of you, some of you at least, will be involved in. On the inside, um, things going on in the life of the church this week. Let me flag up to you the bottom uh, of the left-hand column there. On Wednesday, our congregational prayer meeting. Do come and join us as we uh, pray together, as we do every fortnight for uh, not just our work here, but our many uh, gospel partners around the country, around the world. Uh, special time uh, for the church family to be at prayer, so uh, do come. If you've never been before, come along and uh, find out what it is that we do. I'm sure you'll uh, find it encouraging. On the back page there, you'll see the details about Christmas, and I think you've all got a, have you all got a Christmas card? Yes, you have. Um, one of these lovely Christmas cards uh, with a nice picture on the front, which Gloria, has, uh, Gloria Shaw has beautifully done for us. And inside, 
Uh, details of all the different Christmas events uh, beginning mainly on the uh, 8th of December and running out through to Christmas Day. So there are lots and lots of these um, on the tables and uh, the entrances. Do take them and uh, use them. They're there for you to use to invite friends and family and others uh, along to these services. And let's be praying together as a fellowship as we, as we aim to do that, to encourage folk to come and uh, to hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus this Christmas time. Um, I'll leave you to, to read the rest of these uh, notices uh, at your leisure, but let me just uh, give you the sad news that uh, one of our members, David Collinson, uh, died rather suddenly just this last week. Some of you know David's been poorly for a while since he had an operation, um, but he uh, died really very suddenly during the week. So do remember Pat, his widow. Uh, the funeral is going to be a week on Monday at 2 o'clock at the Lynn uh, Crematorium. Uh, but we give thanks for David's life and uh, we want to uphold Pat and the family very particularly at this time. Happier news, I think you, if you got the, uh, the um, uh, email update, uh, you'll know that David and Margarita Ely have had a little baby girl called Aurelia and uh, they were at the, the uh, first service this morning at, uh, at Kelvin Grove and all uh, family looking well. So we rejoice with them uh, in this new addition to the church family. Well, we're going to turn to our Bibles and uh, read together now, and um, we're going to read in two places. You'll see we're back into Hebrews chapter 7, Um, so look that up. That's page 1004, and we're going to read very briefly, first of all, in uh, the book of Genesis, and uh, I think that's page 10 if you have one of the church Bibles, and hopefully it'll be obvious why. So, first of all, reading Genesis chapter 14 at verse 17, and then uh, we'll read together the whole of Hebrews chapter 7. Here we are way back in the days, the early days of Abraham and his first foray uh, into the land, and Genesis 14 verse 17, after Abraham's return uh, from the battles that the rest of the uh, chapter are telling about, from the defeat of Chador Lamar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Well, let's turn forward now to Hebrews chapter 7. And I'll read in just from the last verse of chapter 6, where we're told that Jesus has gone ahead of us into the heavens as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever like Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is, first by translation of his name, king of righteousness, Malki Tzedek, uh, king of righteousness. And then he's also king of Salem, that is king of peace, Salem, Shalom. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life. But literally, he was made to resemble the Son of God and continues as a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the spoils. Those descendants of Levi, that's the the priests who received the priestly office, They have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. Though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It's beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men. But in the other case, by one of whom it's testified that 
he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham. But he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Now, if perfection, fulfillment, had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood concerning these things, uh, the, 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 our translation is a little uh, clunky here. Uh, let me read it slightly differently. If perfection or fulfillment had been attained through the Levitical priesthood concerning which the people received regulations in the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, or just better like Melchizedek, rather than the one named like Aaron? For when there's a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it's evident that our Lord was descended from Judah. And in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This became even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who's become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it's witnessed of him, you are a priest forever, like Melchizedek. So on the one hand, a former commandment is now set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. The law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we now draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. Those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. And this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests, you see, were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting, better, it was precisely appropriate that we should have such a high priest that is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law, that is the, the law of Moses, the old covenant, the Mosaic Covenant appointed men in their weakness as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Amen. And may God help us to understand and take in this great message of his holy word. We're going to sing again another uh, hymn on the screens, reminding us that all through the story of God's unfolding salvation, by faith we see His hand right from the beginning of the creation and all the way through the stories from when our fathers roamed the earth right up until these current days.
simple as our uh, offerings for the Lord's work are received now. The musicians will play quietly. You might like to open again and read these uh, verses in Hebrews 7 that we'll be studying together. It's quite a long and complicated passage, so the more familiar we are with it, the better. Perhaps as we do that in the quiet now, our offerings will be received. Father, we're glad to come before you, to draw near into your presence through our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom alone we have access to you, but through whom we have the joy of certain, continuous access forever, so that you are the Father God who hears our prayers and who promises to answer speedily. And there's so many things, Lord, we want to bring before you so many needs and cares and concerns in this world of ours, which is so lost, so adrift, so lacking in knowledge, because persistently human beings want to go their own way, walk in their own wisdom, and turn their backs upon you, your ways, your wisdom, your truth, which is the way of life itself. We should never be surprised at the mess that we see in our world, in our society and our culture and our own nation in these days in which we live with so much political uncertainty, bickering, so much fracture. We pray, Lord, for our nation in these days leading up to the general election. Already the news is full of accusations and counter-accusations of political interference, of dirty tricks, of name-calling. Have mercy on us, Lord, we pray. You command us to pray for those who lead us, who have power over us. And we acknowledge, Lord, with thanksgiving that the institutions of government and rule are indeed your good gifts, your merciful gifts to our society, without which we would be in far greater disarray and disorder and chaos. We, we see that in parts of the world where there is anarchy, civil war, complete lack of government. So help us, Lord, not, not to descend into mere cynicism, but to be thankful for the great freedoms that we have, for the parliamentary democracy that uh, we live under. And yet, Lord, we pray for these leaders for whoever will be our government the beginning of next month, you would give us those who would see clearly, who would pursue matters of truth and of righteousness, who would have wisdom in governing in ways that would bring health and healing and stability to our nation. But, Lord, we are those who know that the answer to the needs of our nation and every nation will never be found merely in earthly governance, however good it might be. We know, Lord, that the needs 
of every nation and every culture is the same. And it is the ultimate driving away forever <clears throat> of the sin, of the darkness, of the evil that resides in the human heart. For as our Lord Jesus said, it's from within our hearts that all these things issue forth to bring damage, disease, decay, to bring fracture in our societies and in our relationships, to hurt, to do evil. And so, Lord, we pray that the proclamation of the true answer, the great fulfillment of all your every promises to heal this human world and its sin, the only answer which is in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his gospel of grace, that that would be heard clearly, loudly, persistently throughout our nation, from every Christian church that names your name. We know, Lord, that so often it seems the trumpet sounds an uncertain sound. It's so easy for us to shrink back from speaking the words of truth and light that are needed because they challenge our world. They're not wanted. They bring us shame and opprobrium. In many places, far worse, real suffering and persecution. But thus it has always been, O God. And you call us to follow in the way of faith as you've called your people from the very beginning to be light in this dark world, to bring the sting of salt, of your word of rebuke and of challenge. Help us, Lord, to be those who do not stray, who don't shrink back, those who have faith and endure and persist in living for our Lord Jesus Christ right until the end. We pray for our own selves here, Lord, in our church and the opportunities that will be presented to us in the coming weeks as we run up to the period of Christmas. Thank you for every additional chance that we have to share the gospel of our Lord Jesus in music, in song, in spoken word. Help us, we pray, as we pray for our friends and our loved ones who still are our people walking in darkness, that we long to see the great light of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you hear us, Lord, and in the midst of us <clears throat> this Christmas season, would you bring into the light of your glorious truth many men and women and boys and girls whom we know and love and long to find the joy and the light that we have found in him. So help us, Lord, to be a people whose eyes and whose hearts <coughs> are moored, anchored in heaven, not taken up with these mere earthly passing things which ultimately are trivial and will all end, but to live for that which is lasting, for that which is forever, and for the glory of our Savior, the Lord Jesus. And to that end, Lord, we pray that as we come to your word now, you would reorient again our hearts, drawing them away from every triviality and fixing them forever on Jesus Christ, our great high priest and king, who gave himself that we might indeed draw near to you now and always. So hear us, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in prayer as we come to God's word, as we sing together uh, our version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father God who dwells in heaven, draw near and hear your children.
Do turn with me then, if you would, to uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 7. We're going to look at it uh, together. <clears throat> Someone asked me the other week um, when we were looking at Hebrews 6, uh, just who is this Melchizedek character that uh, keeps being referred to? At the end of chapter 6, verse 20, Jesus is said to be like Melchizedek. And he first pops up in chapter 5, verse 6, in that quote from Psalm 110, uh, verse 4. And of course, here in chapter 7, uh, he's all the way through. He seems to be quite important. Why? Well, the answer is that a consideration of this rather strange character who appears only in, in Genesis 14 and uh, Psalm 110 in the Old Testament, actually, it will teach us a very great deal about how to read uh, the whole Bible as it's meant to be read and understood. And that is, of course, as one great story of salvation that finds its ultimate perfect fulfillment in our Lord Jesus Christ. So you can read the Bible. You can even know vast tracts about the Bible, even about obscure people like Melchizedek. And yet you can miss completely what it's all really about. That's what Jesus said, wasn't it, of, of many of his Jewish contemporaries in his day. John chapter 5, he said to them, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it's these that bear witness to me, and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. They misunderstood their own Bible in a completely fundamental way, simply because they didn't seem to grasp the basic truth that the story of a promise must look for and at last find its resolution in fulfillment. Pretty basic, isn't it? A promise looks beyond itself, and it must be fulfilled beyond itself. Well, from the very beginning of the Hebrew Scriptures, they are a story of the promise, God's promise to undo the wrecking of this world brought about by man's rebellion against God and to restore the righteousness, the perfect harmony of God's relationship with man once again. Right back in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, after the curse, God promises salvation through the seed of the woman. And as the story goes on, well, that seed is promised to Abraham as being his progeny that would ultimately bring blessing not just to his family but to all the nations of the earth. And as that story of Abraham's family, the people of Israel unfolds, God continues to paint in more and more clearly the picture of how at last that promise is going to be fulfilled for the world. And the whole story is a living prophecy pointing forward to the fulfillment which will at last come as God is true to his covenanted promises to his people to be their savior. And so the, the whole story of the Old Testament in that sense is prophetic. Not just in, in, in prophesied words, but in a whole rich tapestry of, of foreshadowings and of intimations about the future in, in people, in events, in the institutions, in the, in the ceremonies that God uh, prescribes for the people of Israel to show them and, and through them to show the world the nature of the salvation that he has planned and that he will bring at last to fruition in the world. And all of these, uh, according to the Lord Jesus, all of these find their fulfillment in him, in his person. And in his work as our ultimate savior. That's why he says in, in Matthew's gospel, chapter uh, 11, that all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, John the Baptist, the greatest of all the prophets. He's the Elijah who was to come, said Jesus. But now, now that I've come, the kingdom of God that was promised is now advancing in fulfillment of all of these things. It's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 3, that, that Christ is the end. He's the goal, ultimately, of the whole law of Moses to bring that promised righteousness of God, to bring that great restoration for all who believe, whether Jew or Gentile. In Jesus is fulfilled that promise to Abraham that through his seed, all the families of the earth would at last be blessed through faith in that ultimate seed, our Lord Jesus Christ. So as Jesus says, everything that, that Moses wrote of and spoke about 
was ultimately about him. He wrote of me, he said. And so if you really believe Moses, you'll believe in me. And that's what the book of Hebrews, of course, is telling us again and again all through. The law of Moses, including all of its regulations about priests and sacrifices and the tabernacle and so on, it foreshadows, it prophesies about things still to come, things that would at last find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And in chapter 8, verse 5, we'll see next time, he says that the priesthood was a copy and a shadow of true heavenly things. That is, it foreshadowed the fulfillment to come because they were genuine copies of heavenly realities. They were earthly manifestations of great heavenly truths, earthly representations, if you like, of eternal realities, which taught God's people and taught us through what we read in the Old Testament Scriptures about the eternal way of salvation. But of course, and this is the crucial thing, being only copies, they never had any power in and of themselves to effect eternal salvation. You can look at detailed photographs of a car in a brochure, can't you? Read the description of all of its features, and that can educate you about the kind of car that you might need or you might want. But that picture of a car can't actually drive you anywhere. All it can do is make you long for that car, and it can, it can direct you to the car dealership, where at last that real car is going to be found that you can drive in. Well, one of the central realities, you see, that God taught his people in these former days under Moses, the days of promise in the old covenant, was about the need for forgiveness of sins. That was what's needed to restore true fellowship with God. And that could only be through sacrifice for sins. And for that, you needed priests to offer these sacrifices on behalf of the people. That's what you... What you find in all the legislation about priests and sacrifices and tabernacle and so on in the book of Exodus and Leviticus. But clearly, for sinful people to be restored to permanent fellowship with God, then a perfect and, and permanent sacrifice for sins would have to be made. And that would obviously only have been achieved when, well, when the curse of death, which is the wages of sin, was seen to be no more when there's a perfect restoration of fellowship with God because that's restoration to life before the curse, life without human death. And of course, the, the relentless cycles of, of sacrifices in the tabernacle and the temple clearly showed that that had not yet been achieved because all the people still died and more and more sacrifices were needed. And it was just the brochure, you see. It was showing what was needed, but never able to affect that reality on a permanent basis. And so the whole Old Testament covenant law was always still looking forward. It was needing more. It was longing for more. It was looking in hope, well, for a forever priest at last who would be able to effect a forever sacrifice, to bring that eternal forgiveness, to restore eternal fellowship with God forever, eternal life. That is not through a, a priesthood and sacrifices like that of the Levites under Moses, but only through a totally different kind of priesthood, a unique one, an ultimate priesthood, one that would be permanent and perfect and therefore powerful to actually achieve the supreme and, and sufficient salvation, to really save forever frail human beings from their sins. But that's what God was promising in the Scriptures through Moses, way, way back in these ancient days from the beginning. And that is exactly what he has fulfilled in these last days for us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this chapter in Hebrews 7 is telling us so very clearly. So let's look first at verses 1 to 10, where we see uh, why Melchizedek uh, comes into this picture. Because you see, in former days, in long ago, what God was actually bearing witness to constantly through Moses' writings about the history of God's people, what he was bearing witness to was the unique permanent supremacy of the Lord Jesus Christ, of a promised priestly king 
over the whole world who were still to come. The truth is, you see, that the Bible tells us, doesn't it? Before the the foundation of this world, God always purposed to bring salvation to this world through His Son, through His Son becoming a unique, permanent, heavenly priest for His people. And what verses 1 to 10 tell us here is that even before God's sworn covenant with Abraham, this chap Melchizedek prefigured the coming Son of God in the Bible's account and bore witness as one who appeared extraordinarily as a priest who is totally in a class of his own, who's unique, who's supreme, who's permanent, who precedes Abraham and indeed is preeminent over Abraham and all his seed, including every single priest that came through his lineage, through Levi. Melchizedek, verse 3, was made to resemble the Son of God, the one who alone is is permanent in his priesthood forever. In other words, the whole reason for the existence of Melchizedek, the whole reason for his appearance in the Bible story is simply to be a pointer to the coming one who would at last be the priestly king over this whole world forever. And verses 1 to 3 are telling us that plainly that is why Moses wrote this account in Genesis 14 that we read tells about this man that Abraham met, who was the priest of God Most High. But he was a priest like no other in the whole Old Testament, radically different from all the priests under the Mosaic law. First, verse 2, notice he was a, a priest king. That's utterly unique in the Bible. None of Israel's priests were kings. His name, king of righteousness, Melech Zedek. What an extraordinary name. And then also, king of peace because he was king of Salem, probably Jerusalem. But he's not some kind of mystical figure. He's not some sort of angelic figure or divine figure. Verse 4 is plain. So is verse 6. It just clearly calls him this man. Sometimes uh, people have extrapolated all kinds of fanciful ideas about Melchizedek from the words in verse 3 where it says that he had no father or mother, no end of life. The words don't literally mean that. They just mean that he had no recorded genealogy, no no recorded origins, no recorded successes as a priest. The point that's being made, you see, is that he stands in total contrast to all the Levitical priests because they were priests only by virtue of their genealogy being proper. They were totally unlike Uh, He was totally unlike all these other priests. He was totally unlike every other figure you read of who's got any significance in Genesis. You just need to read. They're all genealogies, aren't they? Everybody appears with their origin and their successors. But he doesn't appear in any of these things. So as far as the Scriptures are concerned, verse 3, he just appears uniquely. No recorded origin, no recorded end. He's just there. And so... As far as the Bible text is concerned, he just remains a priest. We're never told that he retires or he passes on to one of his sons like all the Levites did. So in that way, in 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 the unique way that he figures in the Genesis account, he is made to resemble the Son of God. He prefigures by deliberate design the unique eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ. That's why God made him exist. That's why he he appears in the Bible at all. That shouldn't surprise us because if the Son of God is the center and the purpose of all creation, of the the whole story of of this world and the story of its redemption, then as uh, as Gary William helpfully puts it in one of his books, um, the things used in the Bible to describe God were created in order to do just that. In fact, Gary Williams has a a further interesting comment on that. He says, everything in the whole creation that God made was principally to reveal himself to us. That's why lions were made. Next time you go to the zoo or to the safari park, ask yourself, why are there such things as lions? And he says, the real answer, although lions are there to kill antelope and, you know, feature in David Attenborough movies and so on, the real reason that God made lions was so he could use them to help people understand his greatness. And in a sense, as with lions, so with with Melchizedek, everything in creation and everything in the Bible story is there to reveal God to man. 
It gets clearer in verses 4 to 10 because it shows us just how much greater Melchizedek must have been to all the, the Levitical priests, all the priests of the tabernacle. He points us, doesn't he, to, to Melchizedek's preeminence, but also to his permanence. First, his preeminence, verse 4. See how great this man was. Why was he so great? Well, Abraham, the great Abraham, spontaneously gave him a tenth, a tithe of everything. By contrast, you see verse 5, the Levites, well, they got their tithes from their fellow people through a commandment in the law that Moses gave them. But this man, verse 6, who's not a priestly Levite by descent, he receives a tithe from the father of all Israel, Abraham. And notice verse 6, he blesses Abraham. He blesses the man who had the promises from God himself. So clearly, look at verse 7. There can't be any dispute, can there? He was greater than Abraham. The greater one blesses the lesser. So he is preeminent. And verse 8, he's permanent. The Levites were mortal men. But as we've said, Melchizedek doesn't appear as a, as a link in a genealogical train or chain. He just appears, just living. And that's why, you see, Psalm 110 picks up this figure, Melchizedek, figuratively, and calls him a priest forever. He's been made to resemble the one who truly is forever, the Son of God. And Abraham tithes to Melchizedek because he represents on earth as his priest the Most High God, the one who is, who is superior to Abraham and the one who truly does rule Abraham forever. But it's not merely a figurative thing. Look at verses 9 and 10. It's historical too. Because Levi, who was the father of all uh, Israel's dynasty of priests, he was literally still in the loins of his ancestor, Abraham. And so in a sense, he, through Abraham, also paid homage to Melchizedek long before the, the priesthood was even begun, long before the tabernacle had even been invented. You see what he's saying? Way back then, even then, Melchizedek was brought into the story by God to awaken among his people the idea of a great priest king, of a kind of priest who was unique, who was, who was supreme, who was eternal, who was in a class of his own, totally unlike all these others, to show that the Most High God has a priest far greater than Abraham. And a concept of priesthood that, that vastly supersedes even the priesthood of the Mosaic Covenant long before that even came into being. A priesthood that had a far, far greater scope than, than just for the nation of Israel indeed. A priest, <coughs> excuse me, who was a copy of the heavenly things themselves. Priest who was a copy of the Son of God who was to come, the priest king of righteousness and of peace. So what he's saying, you see, is that the Old Testament itself, as far back as, as Moses' writing, through whom all the laws about, about priests and sacrifices came, it recognizes that there is a kind of priesthood of a far greater order altogether, not yet seen among any of the priests of Israel. That's why, you see, the heart of the Old Testament faith was exactly that. It was faith. It was faith in, in the promise of God's salvation that looked forward to the fulfillment of that promise. And Abraham and all the patriarchs, we know from Hebrews 11, they died not having received the promise. They died acknowledging that they were strangers and exiles on this earth because they were looking for a heavenly city. Their hope was never fixated just on an earthly home and earthly religion, but on an eternal home, an eternal righteousness and relationship with God. And so as Israel's history unfolds and, and limps on from disaster to disaster as God's people kept rebelling and eventually they were exiled right out of the land in order to humble them, yet all through that there were people of true faith who were encouraged by the prophet, prophet Habakkuk and others to live by faith in the promise, knowing that one day the whole world will at last be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. 
And all the prophets spoke of of that coming day of the Lord to come, the day of great restoration through God's Messiah King. And those of true faith trusted and longed for that day all through the centuries, right up until you read in the beginning of Luke's gospel about people like Simeon and Anna and Elizabeth and Zechariah, people who we are told are, are walking humbly in the law of Moses and longing for the consolation of Israel, for God's promised salvation. These were the true Jews, the true Israelites who understood their scriptures. And so we're longing for the great king, for the Messiah, and for the one whose rule would be bound up with saving his people from their sins forever. That brings us, you see, to verses 11 to 19, because in these former days of waiting, what God was bearing witness to constantly in all the Mosaic legislation about the the sacrifices and the priesthood and so on, what he was testifying about was to the ultimate perfect sufficiency of our Lord Jesus, the coming one, the priest king, who would be at last the real ultimate savior of this world. God had always purposed to bring salvation to this broken world through his son becoming the perfect human priest to make perfect, permanent atonement for sin. And what verses 11 to 19 show us, you see, is that even after God's covenant with Moses, the inherent imperfection of the Levitical priesthood, that showed clearly that this could only ever be a provisional arrangement, only ever be something that's pointing forward and looking for for ultimate fulfillment. Because it was so obvious that this priesthood was just passing and not permanent, that the sacrifices were were perpetual, never-ending. They couldn't be perfect. And so the whole system was of itself ultimately powerless, not powerful to actually deal with people's sin and guilt forever. In its very nature, it pointed forward to the need for fulfillment and to look for fulfillment in the perfect, permanent sacrifice, which would at last be powerful, to bring lasting forgiveness of sins and therefore lasting and complete fellowship with God. And that's the point in verses 11 to 14. This was perfectly plain. If perfection, if complete fulfillment was attainable through the Levitical priesthood, well, why on earth did God have to promise in the Psalms and his own scriptures that another type of priest altogether would have to come? A priest not like the Levitical priest, not like Aaron, but like Melchizedek. Every Jew knew that Psalm 110 was speaking about the Messiah, God's promised king, God's son, who would come and rule over all the nations. But that psalm tells us that that son was also going to be a priest forever, like Melchizedek. Not like the Levitical priests. Not the kind of priesthood that verse 11 says the people received the law, laws and regulations about through Moses. No, this priest was going to be totally different. And hence verse 12, when that happened and he came, well, the whole system of laws was obviously going to have to change. Because he wasn't going to be fitting into the old system. He wasn't coming from the tribe of Levi, like all the old priests. He was coming from the tribe of Judah. No priest ever came from the tribe of Judah, verse 13. There's plenty, of course, about kings coming from the tribe of Judah, going way back to Moses' time, right through the prophets and the Psalms, just like here. See, what he's saying is it's obviously understood in the Old Testament scriptures themselves Now, when God's promise of his ultimate priest king, the promise made in Psalm 110, when it came to fulfillment, everything would change. Because as verse 12 says, when there's a change in the priesthood, then necessarily there must be a change in all the laws, a change in the whole way that God's covenant with his people is administered and operates. So the law of Moses, he's saying, itself prophesied that a new kind of priesthood altogether was going to come and therefore that that would necessarily mean a whole new kind of covenant would have to come. And that's what was promised. 
And that is what happened when Jesus came. And so verse 15 says, it made everything even more evident. Because a priest like Melchizedek came, who wasn't a priest through legal requirements about genealogies, but verse 16 was declared a priest through the power of an indestructible life. And he really was, as verse 17 says, really was one who was a priest forever, not by earthly regulations, but by eternal resurrection. In his resurrection, we've already seen in chapter 4, verse 14, Jesus has passed through the heavens into the real presence of God. Or as it was put in chapter 6, verse 19, beyond the curtain, not, not of the earthly tabernacle or temple, but into the heavenly throne room of God himself. Because he has made at last the ultimate, perfect, sufficient atonement for sin. To bring his people permanent forgiveness. And therefore permanent fellowship with God. And so you see verse 18, that's why at last what was just an imperfect and prophetic covenant, the former commandment, has been set aside. It was in itself weak and useless. It could only point forward and promise ultimate forgiveness. On its own, it could never actually bestow it. But now, verse 19, it's given way to a better hope, which is, as verse 22 calls it, a better covenant. The fulfillment, the perfection, the reality of everything that the Mosaic covenant pointed to. And now we, in these last days, can actually draw near to God forever. You see, perfect fulfillment was never attainable under the Levitical priesthood. Verse 11 is very plain. Verse 19, nothing was made perfect by that. But now, in Jesus Christ, there is perfect fulfillment. And Moses spoke about that day. The whole Old Testament looked for it and longed for it. But now, in these last days, it's come. Look at verse 19. Sinful people can draw near to God again, can be in right relationship with God. The reality that was lost ever since Eden, at last it is restored through Jesus Christ and his ultimate perfectly sufficient priestly ministry for us. Under Moses, of course, yes, there was drawing near to God in faith, but, but ordinary people were still at a distance, weren't they? And it was imperfect. It needed perpetual sacrifices, offerings, regulations galore, priests galore. But now, look at verse 19. We all, all of us, ordinary people, we draw near to God through the better hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. He is a priest forever for us. Of course, we don't yet have it all. We're, we're still saved in hope, aren't we? We haven't yet entered God's eternal rest. We've seen that. We haven't yet seen his face. We haven't yet inherited the heavenly city. We haven't yet physically possessed the world to come. That awaits the coming of the Lord Jesus. But already, the great privilege of living in these last days of this world after Christ's death and resurrection is that already we have a better hope. We can draw near to God in full assurance of faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what's underlined in verses 20 to 28 at the end here. Because you see, it's the coming of Jesus in these last days that bears wonderful witness to the uttermost powerful salvation that we have now through Jesus Christ. God has brought his, his promised salvation to the whole world through his Son. The utterly powerful heavenly priest and human priest the one that we really need. The perfect sacrifice of his earthly passion has brought permanent forgiveness for us with God forever. And the perfect sufficiency of his heavenly presence brings us permanent fellowship with God forever. All the saints of, of old, they had a great hope in God's promise for that ultimate fulfillment. But, but the wonderful privilege we have in these last days is that our hope, he says, is even better. Because already we are tasting the wonders of the world to come. When there will be no separation ever again, even physically, between us and our great God and Savior. Already, 
As we await that day, we can draw near to him now with certainty, continually and completely. Verses 20 to 22 tell us we have certainty about forgiveness from God now and fellowship with God. It's God's oath. Remember what we read in chapter 6, verse 18. We have the certainty of two unchangeable things, not just God's covenant promises to Abraham and Moses in the former days, but we have the oath that David speaks of in this psalm, God's own oath to his son, a totally different order of things from these merely earthly regulations about priests. Here in Jesus is God's sworn oath forever, a new covenant sealed indeed in the blood of his son, guaranteed on his own life and by his risen life. So Jesus, he says, is the guarantor, the absolute guarantor of a better covenant altogether. A guarantor is somebody who stands behind with a promise to pay. You might guarantee a mortgage for your children if they don't have the money to to back it up. Well, standing behind this guarantee is the indestructible life of the risen Lord Jesus Christ who will never, ever fail us. His priesthood is forever. It's utterly certain. And therefore, as verses 23 and 24 tell us, you see, we have certainty of continuous forgiveness and fellowship with God. Human priests, you see, died. You had to have lots of them. And a priest, if he died in office, well, there could be a gap in the sacrifices being made. There'd be a breach of of fellowship with God. But that can never happen. When Jesus is our priestly savior, I will never leave you and forsake you, he says. So we can say confidently, the Lord is our helper. What can anyone do to us? To accuse us of our sin, to erode our confidence in our salvation. There's nothing that we can even do ourselves to separate us from his love. We have continuous forgiveness from him forever. And so you see, in verse 25, we have in him complete forgiveness and fellowship with God. He saves to the uttermost when we draw near to God through him. That means there can't be anything, can there, that awaits you or me on the great day of judgment that God is not able and willing to save us from on that day. Nothing. Or indeed every day between now and then, he lives in the presence of God as our advocate forever to save to the uttermost, to to give to us the uttermost grace and mercy from God. The wonderful picture of that, if you go back later and read in Exodus chapter 28, I think it is, about the clothing of the high priest when he went into the, the holy place of God, and he had on his garment, on his shoulder, two stones bearing all the names of the people of Israel, and a breastplate over his heart, Likewise, with the names of God's people. And he stood in the presence of God before him with the names of God's people on his heart. And our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, does that for us, for you and for me, your name and mine, continually, completely, with certainty. He always lives to make intercession for us. Our great high priest, whose name is love, who ever lives and pleads for you and me, And so that means we can be certain that we have complete forgiveness with God continually and forever. And so we can draw near to God our Father continually, forever. So you see verses 26 to 28 just sum it up. So indeed it's fitting, it's it's precisely appropriate that we have such a high priest. One translation puts it very graphically. Here at last is the high priest we really need. Truly powerful to save us forever. Because he's not like us. He's not like any human priest, verse 26. Not like any sinful man, but rather he is exalted above the heavens. The perfect, supreme son of God. Perfectly obedient in his life and and therefore able to make for us the perfect sacrifice for sins. You see, verse 27, offering up himself once for all for our sins so that we might be brought back to that nearness with God forever. We have at last permanent forgiveness from God through his earthly passion for us. He died to make the perfect sacrifice for us. And so we have at last permanent fellowship with God through his heavenly presence for us. 
because he ever lives to make intercession for us. See, in Jesus Christ, all the covenant promises of God have come at last to covenant perfection. All the, the laws, foreshadowings, have been eclipsed by the light of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That's what verse 28 at the end is saying, summing it all up. The law of Moses, the old covenant era, it was a wonderful covenant of promise, looking forward for fulfillment. But it had to make do for its actors with priests and prophets, weak mortal men whose inadequacies, whose, whose deficiencies insisted that we look for more and better still to come. But in the gospel of Jesus, you see, in the new covenant, fulfilling at last the oath of the priest king to come, now we have at last eternal reality. We have the Son of God made perfect forever as our glorious Savior. That is, as, as we saw back in chapter 5, verse 9, now, having been perfected, having fulfilled all that God promised through what he suffered for us, he has become the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him because he's been designated as a priest forever like Melchizedek. His living presence in heaven for us is because of his dying passion on earth for us. But because at last he perfected God's promised forgiveness through his earthly cross, he's now made possible for us perfect fellowship with God in his heavenly court forever and ever. And that means, friends, that all the, the previous need for the rituals of earthly religion have been set aside forever because in Jesus, we have the reality now. We don't need the copies anymore. We have everlasting righteousness. We don't need the rituals of religion that's why we have today, we who, who believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have, says chapter 8, verse 1, such a high priest, one who ministers in the true tent in heaven, the one that God has set up, God's eternal dwelling, not just man's earthly copy. So why, he is saying, would you ever think of going back to that, the copy that was passing? Why would you go from, from the fulfillment that God has given you to the mere foreshadowings, from the reality of near relationship with God to go back to the rituals of mere religion? That's why he's going to such length here to explain all about how God's promises have all been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Because you see, many of these Jewish Christians he's writing to were being tempted back to something familiar, to something visible, something much more acceptable to society that would, would not have them uh, scorned and, and, uh, uh, and, and berated for giving up their Jewish faith. To go back to the priests, to the temple, to the sacrifices. Look more impressive. You can, you can see a temple, can't you? You can see the sacrifices on the altar. You can't see the heavenly temple for the Lord Jesus at the right hand of God. And it made for a more peaceful way for them. They didn't have to have the, the stigma, the shame, the suffering of, of giving up on their, their cultural identity as Jews. And what our writer is saying, no, 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 to go back is to lose everything. To go back to the world of shadows, of preliminaries, when you should be rejoicing in the great reality of drawing near to God with intimacy, with, with an immediacy you've never had before, that is the way of disaster. Why would you ever want to do that? But friends, here's the reality. The lure of earthly religiosity is a very powerful thing. And it can draw people back from the liberation of heavenly realities right into that sort of religious bondage. In the ensuing centuries after this letter was written to churches, very probably around Rome. Well, the church of Jesus Christ, centered upon Rome, started to build churches that looked like temples, with altars at the front of them and screens that separated priests from ordinary people and brought back all the distance that Jesus came to get rid of. Everything that he came to abolish, the Christian church over its history has so often brought right back in. And the church of Rome today... It's full of all of these things that Jesus Christ came to get rid of. And yet many people are drawn to these visible, tangible, 
earthly rituals. But if perfection could have come by such things, the Son of God would never have had to come to earth, would he? But he did come as the great high priest that we so desperately need. He died and he has risen forever to be a permanent, perfect, powerful priest for everyone who looks to him as Savior, which means that no other priest is ever needed for our access to God, for drawing near to him. We don't need priests to do that for us. We don't need saints to pray for as intermediaries. We don't need praise priests. The kind of people who think that at the front of a church service today, they've got to sing their songs interminably, endlessly, in order to lead us so that we can draw near to God. We've already drawn near to God through Jesus Christ. We have a Savior, a holy Savior, who is able to atone for our sins forever and has done. And a human Savior who is able to have compassion for us and intercedes on our behalf, who loves us forever and who lives forever, right now, continuously with our names upon his heart in the presence of God, our judge. And whenever we call out to God the Father in his name, we're drawing near to the one who has loved us with an everlasting love in Jesus. And we can be assured, friends, that we have always in Jesus the great high priest that we really need who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, who saves us certainly and continuously and completely forever and ever. That's the privilege that you and I have of living in these last days. Let's never give it up. Let's pray. He is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for them. We thank you, Lord, that we live in these last days when you've spoken your final word to this world in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ and completed your finished work forever for us. That we should know you as nearly and as closely and as intimately as your own Son has enabled us to do. So guard us, Lord, and keep us, we pray, from ever being driven back that which is so much less. Keep us, we pray, drawing near to you forever through our great Savior. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as we close the hymn on the screen. So bless the God of Israel who comes to set us free, who visits and redeems us and grants us liberty, fulfilling all the promise of the prophets in our Lord Jesus Christ.
and so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.